welcome to episode one of what we're calling Behind the Message, where we're going to take a behind-the-scenes look uh, with some of our teaching team here at Open Door Church. We're going to take a behind-the-scenes look and see what goes into making a message series. And uh, the best way I think I could describe it for you, uh, I love watching movies, love a great movie, and one of the things I love to do after I've seen a great movie is check out the behind-the-scenes, how they made the movie. And many times, uh, a director puts a lot of energy and effort into scenes that never make the final cut in the movie because of various reasons. Uh, That's what this uh, series is all about. We want to share maybe some things that hit the cutting room floor, maybe things that just informed the message. Uh, So we're going to talk about everything from uh, issues that we're facing in our culture, theology, um, everything that we're processing going in to craft a message here at Open Door Church. That's what this is about. And so we're calling it Behind the Message. It's going to be an ongoing conversation. We just finished up a series that we called Uncommon, and we, what we've said throughout the series is that we can't approach an uncommon God in an uncommon way. And so we're going to talk about that series and uh, unpack a couple of concepts that we touched on that we shared throughout the series, but we didn't really get to dig into a whole lot because of time. Um, to start with, Pastor Aaron, why don't you share um, kind of your heart behind this series, this podcast, these videos, what you want to accomplish, and then maybe share about uh, why Uncommon, why that series for this time. Well, I do think that this specific podcast for our people is very important. I think we live in a day where we're saturated by information, um, but we also live in a day where people don't know how to use that information in a wise way. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of competing voices. Uh, You know, I've told pastors I get a chance to speak into, this is the hardest day that I know of to pastor and shepherd people in because they're being inundated with different messages, different information. Now, COVID has uh, struck and we're all televangelists on some <laughs> some sort. And so, you know, you can see 20 different messages on a weekend. And I guess some of that is good, but the downside of it is that we really have a tendency to stand more on man's opinion of God's Word than the actual knowledge of it ourselves. And it's also, just when you're saying that, it's also hard to actually be rooted in a local church. Yeah. Because I I can attend church anywhere. That's right. And and I think there's, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But as we also submit to the shepherds or allow our heart to be shepherded by uh, those God has called to be shepherds, we've got to recognize that this is a journey and that we're building something. And if we're not careful, we become those itching ears that Paul spoke about, looking for things that align with our theology. Mm -hmm. And we're always supposed to conform to what God says, not try to get God to conform to what we say. And so I think this is very important. Uh, You know, COVID is not the end. Mm -hmm. I I know that, you know, there's there's definitely some crazy mess out on social media talking about the tribulation and end times. And I know that's a hot topic. And we're going to talk about some of that throughout these podcasts. But this isn't end, but I do believe this is a moment of grace upon the church to check the oil, if you will, that we would recognize, where's the cracks in us that we really need to shift and adjust? And this is one of those cracks that, hey, we're going to adjust how we do ministry so that we can build firm foundations, deep roots, so that no matter what comes, we aren't getting blown to and from because we're planted in God's Word. Can I get a good amen? Amen. All right. (laughs) Also, the uncommon thing (laughs) Yeah, come on. We need an organ. Uh, But the uncommon title, I think, is just very important to me personally. Uh, You know, God's been awakening in my heart for the last few years, really going back almost 10 years, some of the uncommon things that we find in Scripture. And we just have a way in life, in the monotony of life, to just take some things in a flippant way. Mm -hmm. And when I look at my boys, I've got an 11-year-old and a 5-year-old. One of the things that I uh, really do get concerned about with the next generation is that they would take for granted the things of God because it's so common. It's in front of them all the time. They're here, and that's a blessing. But how then, as a parent, do I begin to awaken in them that not everything's the same? You know, 
And I think it's in that that we discover how rich and good and how God's placed this thing together, put this puzzle together for all eternity. And uh, and I just think it's a very important moment that uh, in, a, in a world where there's a lot of things that have been taken away, mm-hmm. there's some things that the church can't allow to be taken away because God said, hey, that's special. Yeah. And if God said it's special, then whether I understand it or not, we need to help teach our people that it's special because God said it. It's good. So one of the things that um, I think it was in week three, we titled it, What Are You Reaching For? Which, love the title, by yeah, the way. it's a great title. Is it cool? You always have great titles. That's yeah. right. I work really hard on it. I know. I know. You're going to start naming my messages. <laughs> Cinema. You talked about, and I love the example where you talked about the breast piece mm-hmm. in the Old Testament. but And you did a great job sharing in the limited time you had. But... I think this is a great opportunity to elaborate on that. Okay. Like, share. I think it's great to talk through that because there's so much in the Old Testament that is um, appropriate for us to study today. Okay. So, first off, I'm infatuated with the tabernacle. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Every, it, it, every detail was patterned um, after something that God saw in yeah. heaven. So whatever Moses built into the Ark of the That's Covenant, good. the mercy seat, it was a recreation. It was a representation of something that God already had before him in the heavenly places. So everything is important. And one key person in the whole Old Testament flow in order to for the people to be represented before God, they had to have a mediator, mm-hmm. a high priest. Mm-hmm. And a high priest had a... a really detailed uh, outfit. His brother, from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, he had a serious outfit on, you hear me? And, um, and if he got stuff wrong, it hurt the people. Yeah, mm-hmm. it hurt him and, too. And it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he could drop dead in the process, it was right? A tough job. Yeah, it was a hard job. Yeah, right? nice <laughs> for hey, I want to be the high priest. Yeah. Negative. Yeah, but something is cool about the high priest. The high priest had to be chosen by God. Right. Right? And... And once they were chosen, they were called out or That's sanctified right. mm. um, on their foreheads underneath the kind of the turban that they wrote in war was holiness unto the Lord. Mm. They were That's sanctified, cool. called out. They themselves were uncommon. That's right. They were no longer just a regular dude from down the street. They were now a high priest that would right. go before God on behalf of the people. And there was a, a a piece of the furniture that represented really well was the breast piece. Ultimately, it had 12 stones that had the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And that meant that every time that priest went before God to do anything, offer a sacrifice, sprinkle some blood on the mercy seat, whatever he did, everything that he did was symbolic of not just himself, but all the people that he was in connection and community Mm -hmm. with. And I think that that's so significant for the church today that when we approach God, it's not just my father, it's our father. Mm -hmm. Um, And everything about our prayers, our worship, it's others focused. It's Mm -hmm. never just me focused. If Jesus came and had a me focused mindset, and it was only about himself, then we wouldn't have been redeemed because he right. never got on that cross. <laughs> well, I think what's yeah. cool about the picture of the high priest is that Jesus in Hebrews, he is our high priest. Yes. And so there's symbolism in the connection from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Yes. Even in what Jesus, what he was mentally processing as he went to the cross for us. Absolutely. He was carrying our sin. Right. He bore our transgression and iniquities and so on and so forth. And so inside of the breast piece there was this really cool thing if a priest needed to know something outside of what was at that time the written law Mm -hmm. from god and they needed direction national decision whatever decision that represented the community if they couldn't figure it out they would then go to kind of like god's last resort for discernment Mm -hmm. and this is big they would reach inside of a pouch inside of the breast piece and there were these two stones the Arim and tamim um or as i used to call it the umum and thumim (laughs) and so (laughs) so the Arim and tamim you pull them out and the idea is kind of like we don't fully know exactly how it worked but the gist of it is maybe they would say okay god should we go to battle as david did you know in the passage that we read the message and one of the stones may have you know 
lit up and <laughs> one of the <laughs> which would have been really cool one of them didn't you know what I mean or just the letters on some people believe that God would say yes by the letters right. of the tribes of Israel kind of uh, would light up and they would spell a word on the 12 stones hmm. uh, so however it worked I don't know I really don't need to know the idea was basically they were able to discern the will of God mm through a system that God gave them yeah. so that they weren't clueless in leading the people. That's right. right. And I think that as it relates to us, the Arim and Tamim, the words in Hebrew mean lights and perfections. Perfections. Mm. Lights and perfections. Another way you could say is illumination and, and maturity. Mm. And I think that we're in a moment where there are so many competing voices, yeah. as you said, and what we need are mature believers to right. be the light of the world. Come on. And we are complete in Christ. And you only get deeper roots as you pursue God's presence in worship and as you dive deep into the Word of God. You preached a message uh, this past weekend and you were talking about uh, the Word of God mm -hmm. and how people need to study and dive in. And I'm like, do we know, and I want us to know, that the tabernacle, man, you could spend a year on That's just right. the tabernacle and just being yep. blown away by how beautiful Jesus is yep. and how great his sacrifice is. And so um, I would encourage people to dive in and, and pursue it a little bit deeper, you know? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that you said that's so profound, and I mean, we just went to class right there, school, with what you just talked about. But I think one of the things is I don't understand it all. Mm -hmm. It's one of the comments that you said. And, and I think that of the uncommon things, and I, I say this in one of my messages, we don't understand it. There's a mystery to it. Yeah. Like when it comes to communion, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to these things that God calls holy, mm -hmm. we have an understanding, yet we don't understand fully. Mm -hmm. And it's in these uncommon elements that we discover how awesome our God is. Right. And a God that I can fully understand, I don't actually need. I don't worship as God. Right. But it's a God who calls something uncommon, and I can understand it partially, but it's evidently on a level that my understanding has a ceiling mm -hmm. that but then right. I begin to discover that he is a God who is worthy of my worship. Absolutely. And so there's so many of these things that when we look at the tabernacle, they're now represented in the things that the body of Christ does. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about the labor. We talk about uh, the, the, the mercy seat. We talk about all mm -hmm. these elements that we find within the tabernacle mm -hmm. of God. And now they've become elements. They've become practices. They've mm -hmm. become things that represent now to us. Mm -hmm. We can't approach an uncommon God in right. a common way. Mm -hmm. And recognizing that the awe of God puts us in the right position. Yep is very important and we just live in a day where if we're not careful we just take things for granted you know or we grow up in a in a very uh, religious church we grow up in a very religious practice that yeah. maybe put uh importance on the wrong things mm -hmm. right you know, and, uh, and I become, think well, they can become so rigid that after a while they're burned out on what should be beautiful. That's right. What, Come they, on. what they should still value and yeah. appreciate now becomes either mundane or so rigid that right. they somewhat despise it. Yeah. And I, I think about it like as you were mentioning that I had this thought pop in my head about these uncommon things becoming common. Here you have God brought the children of Israel out. Mm hmm. And he does it with a strong hand. It's just mm -hmm. miraculous, right? <laughs> yep. And all of a sudden, they were hungry, and God brings them manna, like That's literally right. angels' food. You know, did what I'm something saying? new. He did something, something fresh. It was, yep. and it was just for and them. And they loved it at the beginning. They did. Yeah. And then they got <laughs> tired of it. And, and later on, what does Jesus say about himself? I am the, the bread, bread of heaven. Mm, yeah. That's Essentially, good, he's the manna. Right. Are we tired of the manna? Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, how we trying to add to the manna something that isn't the real manna, yeah. and therefore we're getting tired of it. Putting our own human seasoning salt yeah. on, on Jesus, on. trying to make it more palatable mm. for us, instead of just being content with what He gives us right. for that day. And um, that itching ear thing that Paul talks about, where people in the last days are going to have itching ears and they fall to these seducing spirits and different things of that nature. Now, nah, man, we need to come back to deep roots in the Word of God, right. rightly dividing yes. the Word of Truth. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's great. Well. And I think you touched on this in your message a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate on it a little bit. But the when we see in Scripture our preference in worship, <laughs> what does Scripture show us about that? Blow that oh, junk man. up, Sean. <laughs> Come on. Well, the thought that I had was, okay, the high priest 
if they didn't do their job according to the pattern God gave them. Right. They had a rope tied around their ankle. Man, this is Old Testament, so for anybody who's out there, don't be freaking out. God ain't going to drag you out right now. You better get your uh, worship on. Yeah, yeah. Get, drag out of here. get it right, we're going to drag you out. Uh, but basically, if he did it wrong, or if his heart wasn't pure before, or whatever, yeah. they basically would drag him out. That's right. And I would say to that, when we go back to the law of first mention, when was worship first said? Yeah. It was when God commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Right. Something he loved. Something he loved. The precious. When when he was the promise of God. That that see you're preaching now. Yeah. And, and this I mean, there's where, so much in that yeah, story. Yeah. Every yeah. every time. <laughs> yeah. So you got something that was precious to right. him mm-hmm. that he received from God. Yeah, that's right. That was God's was fulfillment gift. of what God said. Mm-hmm. So it belonged to God. Mm-hmm. Right. Came from God. Belonged yeah. to God. And you are just a steward of what is rightfully God the Father's. And then he asks you to give him that. what rightfully belongs to him. That's worship. That's worship. Yes. That whatever we have, whatever we think we own, whatever we think is uh, uh, ours to declare, you know, how we're going to use it. And so that's the law of first mention. So yeah. worship could be defined as obedience and sacrifice. Yeah. And then you go back now to the first family and you got Cain and Abel. And what you find with Cain and Abel is a situation where God was more pleased with one guy's offering than the other. What was the difference between the two? One of them was a sacrifice. One of them came a death out of life, right? Mm-hmm. There was an actual physical sacrifice that was there. And the other one, basically, it was something that grew out of the ground. Mm-hmm. That, that basically, he, yeah. it was no toil, no real labor in it. He just casually took some and just kind of tossed it before God. God was like, that didn't cost you anything. Right. Mm-hmm. Right? Nope, I don't want that. And the guy gets mad. And he, and he then begins to, you know, get frustrated and kill his brother. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so my thing is, when we start thinking about worship, am I offering to God what, number one, his word commands me That's to right. do? Yeah. If he wants me to clap my hands. Then I'm going to clap them. Then I'm going to clap these That's hands. Right. Because he wants me to dance. I'm going to dance. That's right. I mean, you will, well, wait, what if I don't feel like <laughs> You better put some dancing shoes <laughs> on and, yeah. and get to it. Right. And, and here's the thing. This, this is one of the things that gets me. And it's a weird tension. I think when we initially started talking about this series, there was this tension of what is like a healthy, holy awe, right. a holy reverence. Like in the Old Testament, if they thought that they saw something that was like God, they would fall down and be you know, afraid to death. In the New Testament, John, when he saw an angel... He fell down, the Bible says, like he was dead. That's right. Mm-hmm. He just, it, I mean, it just wrecked him when he saw holy beings. Well, there's a reason that beings. the angels typically would say, fear not. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Because <laughs> yeah. that was people's first response. That's right. I don't know if we have that now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This sense of holy awe and reverence for God. And I think that when we get to heaven, some people are going to be shocked. Well, I think a lot of the teaching um, that the American church has done over the last 20, 30 years is trying to be, to make God common. Mm-hmm. But we're trying to make him relatable and uh, because we have a hard time with the tension in between him being distant and him being yeah. near. And, 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 and it is that cycle. I mean, we, we, we see this uh, throughout. If you study church history, you know, we, we, we teach for 20, 30 years that God's far away. Then the next generation comes in and they react to the previous generation. Mm-hmm. So they teach yeah. that he is really near. And there's very few right now that are in the balance of saying, hold on a second, he's both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, one of my favorite thought processes right now is in John when Jesus when John introduces Jesus mm-hmm. and he says he came full of grace and truth right. you know what's so powerful about that is John from the very beginning is blowing everybody's mind out of what is possible mm-hmm. he's saying yeah. literally Jesus was full of two things mm-hmm. you know it's impossible to be full of two things mm-hmm. but Jesus was full of two things mm-hmm. John is saying hey right. Jesus is uncommon mm-hmm. and he can do multiple things at one time he's not just singularly focused right. and so when we recognize that then we as teachers we as people who study the word we've got to understand hold on a second God's bigger than we think he is yeah. and, it, and I'm not talking to the immature believer I'm talking to the most mature believer God is bigger than we think he yeah, is absolutely. you know and recognizing that is a very powerful thing when we go through seasons that we don't understand because then we come back to the place well he thinks differently than me so I don't actually have to understand mm-hmm. I've just got to be obedient to what he's That's calling right. me to do yeah. so. well and, I, and you said this in, in one of your messages it might have been the, the first part of the series you talked about the role of humility um, 
when we talk when we approach God. And so why do you think humility is kind of a lost art in our <laughs> society today? Well, I mean, I think honestly in our yeah, well in our yeah. American society. Let's oh, be real. Yeah, yeah, I don't I mean yeah. Yeah. I think everybody thinks they have the answer, yeah. mm-hmm. and very few actually say it's Jesus. So I think it, it, even already pride is at the catalyst of everything that we see in our society. Mm-hmm. The ultimate level of pride is not being able to listen. Mm. That's good. Um, I mean, most of our, you know, it's interesting to me that you're talking about these stones, right? And so the priest would make some atonement before God, somehow ask a question before God, and then they wait for God to speak. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, maybe we're trying to fill in the gap, and instead of just waiting for Him to speak, the Mm -hmm. ultimate level of pride is the inability to listen. When culture is loud, it means that pride is all around because everybody's trying to answer a question that nobody's actually asking. Mm -hmm. And and I think that when we get to this place of just recognizing that humility has always been the answer before God. God exalts the humble. He puts down the proud. proud, To to, to that thought, Satan, when he fell, it was our wills. It was, yes. it was, it was, it was what, five I wills? That's I will right. ascend above the heights. I will be all. When Jesus came, it was like your will. I That's came, right. my food okay. is to do the will of my Father. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a flip on, again, the ultimate picture of pride is Satan and how he falls. And then the ultimate picture of humility is one who is yeah. divine in and of himself. Yes. And yet he took on the form of a servant. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it, it really does come back to the status of the human heart that the most immature question that any Christian can ever ask is why. It, it, and I don't mean that cutting. It's just that is what it is. The most mature question we can ever ask as a believer is what? What do you desire for me to do? You know, if you go back in the Old Testament, you see Isaiah, you see Samuel. You know, here am I, send me. Uh, here am I, God, I'm, I'm here to do your will. You know, God is looking for individuals who aren't trying to answer everybody else's question, but simply say, God, I'm available to you mm. for to do what you desire yeah. for me to do in this moment. So humility is the posture of our heart. It's not just the posture of our person. Right. And and I think that there's a lot of uh, people trying to have, I mean, my daddy used to say it this way. He said the most unattractive thing anybody could ever resemble is false humility. Hmm. And we've all come across, like when you come in contact with somebody who's falsely humble, who's trying to come across as humble but isn't, mm-hmm. then you know it and, and you feel it, you sense and it. Everybody knows it. You know it, you yeah. know, and it's just some, but when you come across true humility, yeah. uh, also I'd say this, and I think this is a point that, that I think is very important in this day, is there's no greater confidence that a person has than the posture of humility. Mm-hmm. When somebody is actually humble, they are confident because they're not feeling the need to defend. And I think that if we understand that why we are so loud as a culture today is because we're not confident at all. Well, <laughs> we're yelling right. about things, but nobody's actually confident in what they believe. And, and then as the church, we come in and we know why, because the people aren't planted in the Word. Mm. If we're actually planted in the Word, I don't have to sell you on what God's truth is because I know what God's truth is, so I don't have to convince you. That's good. Or we throw Scripture around that we don't really know. Yeah. Right. And we use it as a yeah. as a weapon. Or as a, or as a tweet or, yeah. Yeah. or, or, or yeah. on a little Instagram post or something like that. Well, you know, I, I was thinking about this even in preparation for the podcast today. You know, there's a lot of things that are uncommon that we didn't get a chance to talk to yeah. talk about in the series, you know. But one of them is one of the hot topics that are out there right now, which is homosexuality and marriage and transgender mm-hmm. and all these things. And, you know, one of the reasons why the church has been so loud about it is because it's actually insecure in why God is offended by homosexuality. Mm-hmm. So we talk, we, we shame people over this instead of recognizing why God is so against homosexuality in Scripture is because it messes with the image of God. Mm-hmm. It's a distortion of His image. So the church right. is supposed to be the image bearers of God in the world. Marriage is the image bearer of Christ in the world. Mm-hmm. So when we begin to distort those things, we begin to mess with the image of God. If we actually had an understanding of why marriage between one man and one woman is so important, then we wouldn't have to be mad about it all the time mm-hmm. because we'd be confident in what His Word is. Mm-hmm. And as we navigate these things, we've got to recognize that, yeah, I mean, culture's yelling and screaming, 
But it's really a moment for the church not to be louder than anyone else. It's actually meant for us to be more humble and more secure than anyone else because we're planted and rooted in the right thing. Yeah. So that, uh, the, as you were saying that uh, about humility, I had this thought that came in my mind of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Yes. Right. Right. And, Come on. And, and here he is, right. literally on trial, and for something he didn't do. And he was like, "You know, I could kill you if you don't mm-hmm. answer me." Right. <laughs> and, and then Jesus is like, "You would have no power, right? Yeah, at all, unless my Father gave it to you, right?" And and there was this calm. Well, I love about the, it. I love the question that Pilate asked him because this is what people are asking today. Mm. Jesus mentions truth. Yeah. And Pilate says, "What is, what is truth? truth?" Yeah. As though it was irrelevant. Yeah. In his society. That's right. Yeah. I love it, man. I, I think that, you know, the, the Scripture interprets Scripture. So yeah. when you read the Bible yeah. and you just stop for a second, stop trying to read, you know, 25 passages a day, and you actually read the context of the story, right. mm-hmm. you see that Jesus just didn't say a bunch of stuff. He did mm-hmm. a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. And he didn't tell us to do something that he didn't himself do. That's right. Experience, yeah. you know. And so, man, I mean, how can I not be humble if Jesus, the Son of Almighty God, took off his Godship, came to earth, yeah. died as a man, and humbled himself. Yeah. And, and in fact, Hebrews says, what did he do? He learned obedience. Yeah. Right. Through the things he suffered. Through the things he suffered. Now, that's a crazy statement inside mm-hmm. of itself because, I mean, learned, he's, yeah. Yeah, he learned. So, you know, we get to this place where it's like, man, humility is, is very important. And um, it's, it's really the key that begins to unlock a lot of God's beautiful truths in our life. Yeah. Well, as we get ready to close uh, close out our time together, why don't you, Pastor Aaron, why don't you share uh, some of the background behind the declaration you made, um, I think it was week five of the series, when you, um, you kind of contrasted cultures trying to push everyone, everybody included, everyone included, to pick a side. And you made a powerful declaration at the end of that. I think it would be great. Give us some context and background behind that. I mean, the context is um, that I really just felt like the Holy Spirit checked my heart. I I think um, it's easy in this culture to get caught up in what culture is saying. Mm -hmm. And I just got tired of the division. And I mean, I know everybody else is. I mean, everybody's tired of the division, right? And, and, And so... You know, I get more phone calls right now about people just being fed up with division. And and I don't know, it was after one of those phone calls, I was just praying, and then the Holy Spirit said, well, what are you going to do about it? Wow. And, you know, it was just this awakening in me. And I said it earlier. There is a generation right now that is asking why. But there's also, I believe, a remnant in the church that's beginning to ask God what. And if you go back to Acts, you see that after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the apostles come to a, a community. And one of the apostles gets a prophetic word that there's going to be a famine throughout the entire world. Mm-hmm. And it's just these two verses. And I'd never really seen it before, but their response wasn't, why, God, are you doing this? I thought everything was supposed to be good and we are supposed to heal everybody. Mm-hmm. Their response was, well, what are we going to do? That's it. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, and I just, I know that God's plan at Open Door Church in Eastern North Carolina for this moment. And so what are we going to do? And so that declaration was more me putting uh, faith to words that said, you know what, we're going to address these things. The other thing is, as I said, something very strong about abortion in that, but it actually, you know, wasn't that we're going to be against abortion. It was actually the statement, and I wept when I wrote it, that we will come alongside the young woman who doesn't have any hope, Mm -hmm. who doesn't have any future, and we will let her know there is a different choice to be made about her unborn baby. Mm -hmm. And part of that is this, and this this is very important, and I want everyone to listen to what I have to say on this point, is culture's doing a great job of removing the faces from the issue. And we're yelling about issues instead of connecting faces to individuals to the issue. What I love is is that Jesus lived in a culture that did the same thing. But he ministered to the woman with the issue of blood. He ministered to the prostitute who was brought to his feet that was caught in adultery. He ministered to Mary along the way. Mm -hmm. The Bible is full of names Mm -hmm. and people 
because Jesus never got about an issue. Mm -hmm. He made it about the person. And in doing so, he dealt with the issue, Mm -hmm. but he never made it about an issue more than a face. And I think that in this moment, we need to see the faces of the issues we're talking about Mm -hmm. because it will give us a whole lot more compassion, which Jesus was moved by Mm -hmm. when he was on this earth. That's right. And as we do that, then it becomes powerful, and we become the representation of who he is. Selah. Listen, all of that, bro, I'm just like, wow. I thought, uh, I just had one thought to that. As you were talking, first off, if you have not heard that message, please listen to it, because that declaration in it was so profound. I think um, Paul was like, when I came to you to share the gospel, Mm. he said, I didn't use these enticing words of man's wisdom. But I came to you in demonstration of the Spirit. That's right. There's demonstration and power of the Spirit. And as you were speaking, I just saw, imagine a church that took its message into their hearts right. and were rooted in this compassion. And all we did was just came out and just begin to demonstrate yes. through how we love people. We show people what we value. Yeah. And we value people because... People matter to God, right? right? In a generation where everyone is saying, I didn't do this, mm. God is looking for somebody who will say, I didn't do it, but I'll take responsibility for it. That's right. Because the church, Jesus Christ himself took responsibility for what he didn't do. Yeah. And he's looking for the bride to stand up in this moment and not be about the argument. Well, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't or do that. Or I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to I help sh- with that. Listen, yeah. gee, God is looking for a church that says, "No, no, no, no." Right. I'll take responsibility for what I didn't do because I'm going to be the bridge that somebody can walk across one day to meet Jesus. That's, That's good. good. That's good. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us uh, on this first episode of what we believe will be many conversations about um, the messages we're sharing here at Open Door Church. I want to encourage you, if this ministered to you, share it. Uh, encourage people to like it. And uh, let's get the message out as we continue these conversations. Thank you so much. God bless.